Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Javier de la Cruz at eSilicon. We're going to talk about where the problems are in 2.5D and how they're going to be solved going forward. So Javier, where are we? What are we looking at? Where, where are the problems and how do we solve them? What do you see going forward? So historically with packages, the, uh, the barrier had always been um, your ability to access a very large amount of memory and having to surround these packages with memory. And I'm, I'm speaking more in terms of uh, network processors and things along that line, uh, not your usual consumer application. So the, the package body sizes were dictated really by how many memory I could put around it uh, and what speed and standard memory you could use. Now in going to 2.5D, you're able to use much higher bandwidth memories, an order of magnitude more, and that's, giving, that's shifting where the, the bottleneck is in, uh, in a lot of these packages such that you can now crank up the uh, processing power that you have because of all the memory you can access. And it tends to shift the bottleneck to another location such as um, how quickly you can get information on and off this chip through like a Certes or other, uh, other interface. Why don't you draw it out for us? Sure. So if we take a look at a, uh, a networking application, and we'll say we'll just use a network processor. You have your package, your chip in the middle. The body size you'd normally have on here would be very large because uh, what you tend to have is, let's say, um, on your ASIC, uh, let's use a different color. In red, we'd probably generally put uh, a large memory interface on the east and west sides. And then north and south, we'd keep CERTES and other types of interfaces. And that would really make the bulk of this area of your package dominated by memories. And then you'd surround your package with a bunch of memories all the way around it, you know, somewhere in the ballpark of 12 of them. So this becomes a very large area. And this package became very large because you had to fit all these solder balls on there. So what you'd end up doing if you, if you um, eliminate this, and now say, I'm gonna approach this with a mindset of two and a half D instead. You'd pull out some of the memory that was inside the ASIC, and it could be generally smaller. You'd put it next to a memory device. That memory device would not only take on the memory that was, you know, a portion of the memory that was inside the ASIC, but also take on more than the memory that was surrounding it, uh, maybe an order of magnitude more. So you're able to access, you know, you know, at its most basic level, these chips can take a terabit per second of memory. And some of them on the market are, um, or in early stages, can go up to 16 terabits per second. So it's a very, it's, it's game changing in the approach. And now the, the ball pattern you have here on your VGA, well, I skipped the interposer. I'd say the interposer is on here as well. What you have here now is um, a ball, a package body size. It's not dictated anymore by having to fit enough memory solder balls. Now it's dictated by the size of the interposer, which is dictated by the silicon area. Uh, so your overall package can actually shrink. Even more powerfully than this, you're actually able to uh, reduce the complexity of this package because you've handled most of the interconnect to the memory, which is generally your highest density interface, within the interposure before the package substrate ever saw it. So let's, let's jump into the interposer. What's going on there? Uh, we keep hearing a lot about them, how they're going to save the world and improve communication across uh, between chips and, and make things a lot faster, but there's also some problems there, right? How do we get around them? Sure. So um, as, as we go into that, let's, let's take a look at the most common approach, which is in silicon interposer. The, uh, the biggest complexity you have there really is in, in handling. Uh, the, the overall VIA structure, which has been a big focus in the industry for quite some time, is fairly well understood and a lot of different companies are converging on the same strategy to have an aspect ratio for these VIAs of 10 to 1. Now, in order to get a very high VIA density, you've got to shrink your silicon, uh, the, the silicon thickness. The, uh, so once the silicon thickness gets below 200 microns, if you have a large interposer, they're very difficult to handle and very easy to break. For smaller devices, that's easy. When you get to a big device, that gets to be pretty precarious. So there's other approaches that you can take on this. Uh, one of them is to have smaller tiles on top, maybe use a glass interposer. You could also go to an organic interposer, which is a very uh, strong methodology, one that we've played uh, very heavily over the past couple of years in order to enable a lot of the large chip integration with lots of memory stacks surrounding your, your ASICs. 
What's the value of a, uh, an organic interposer in terms of design, and also what's the cost of an organic interposer versus a silicon one? Sure. So from a design standpoint, what's really attractive is it's, it's much simpler than silicon. You're able to use a lot of the same packaging technologies and packaging design tools that existed before. Your design rules generally change, the, um, but from a cost standpoint, on an area basis, it's less expensive than silicon, but what's more powerful is the assembly, the handling of it. You no longer need to have temporary wafer bonding or having the uh, risk of fracture during assembly. Uh, they're very easy to handle, and uh, you know, so hence the assembly cost would, should be able to be considerably lower long term in production compared to silicon. So where do you see this design coming into play? Is it after uh, 16, 14 nanometers? Is it before 16, 14? There's a lot of confusion out in the market right now. So let's let's talk about uh, let's talk about the landscape of the, the various wafer nodes and how Moore's law is changing. So if we consider, you know, an older wafer node like you know point point one eight going to point one three, all the way through 20 nanometer, 20, you know, 14. We all know, and it's very it's pretty well understood in the industry that the cost goes up exponentially. In fact, here, once you go above 28, it's a bit of a step function because you've got so many more masks uh, involved here. And this is on a, um, a NRE, also from a cost, per, a cost per gate basis. What this is doing is, because we're all marching down the path of Moore's Law, uh, fewer companies that can really tape out a lot of chips at 0.13 are no longer able to do so in 20, and they're putting more eggs in the single basket. And hence, the number of new tape outs going on has been decreasing precipitously as well. Well, when you have fewer tape outs, you have fewer design teams that understand it well, and you also are losing uh, the critical knowledge needed to ensure, you know, once you tape out a lot of these devices, you can get really good at it. You only tape out once, one of these a year, or one every two years, you, you may not get that special recipe. So uh, you're, you're creating this inversion here that's uh, very problematic. Now what's actually going to be a, a changing dynamic is this curve. This curve here is cost per gate. Per gate. Historically, it had always been going down, and at 28, it was at its lowest point, and since then, it's been going back up. This is going to change where people really want to target their uh, new tape outs. Few companies are going to be willing to pay the premium at 20 and 14 nanometer just really for the benefit of uh, performance and, and power reduction because when you do your analysis for return on investment from a standpoint of um, you know, cost per silicon and when you can amortize out the, the new NRE, you, once you, you, the, the math never turns positive past 28 nanometer. So because of that, folks are gonna be hanging out at 28 nanometer for quite a long time. We're gonna, as an industry, stay there for much longer. So what's that gonna do? Given the same wafer node, how do you go ahead and improve your performance, pack more features in there, and that's tied into the 2.5D and 3D technologies we spoke about earlier. So from the standpoint of uh, most uh, chip makers, they really don't have to get to double patterning. A lot of the things that have been looming in front of them, you don't have to go there. There is another option. Sure. So um, will that happen at 28? What may end up happening is you, well, maybe you can move this inflection point down to you know, one more node. No matter what, this is going to happen. You, you'll need to end up going to double patterning or something along those lines when you go down to the trigate structures. And uh, you know, regardless, you're gonna need to have more mass steps and it'll take longer each time, particularly given that the uh, extreme ultraviolet exposure takes much longer than existing wafer technologies do. This industry is filled with a, a bunch of cynicism in terms of every time it looks good on paper, it doesn't necessarily turn out to be good as good as it looks on schematics. So, where are you seeing problems going forward, and how close are we to solving them? So for the longest time, this whole um, two and a half D structure business has been in uh, in PowerPoint mode. So um, more recently, we've we've had a lot more pictures, many more press releases of folks making new devices. We're now putting the uh, the, the pedal to the metal here and uh, getting the data needed. So it's no longer theoretically what might work best, but in reality what measurement data may show up to, to tell us. And uh, we're learning a lot more from that. What's your time frame for rollout? Well, we're already prototyping devices in 2.5D. We're expecting to have 
um, several um, proof of concept devices and uh, development of IP needed for this market over the next year, and we would expect um, you know production to occur more towards 2015. What happens to heat when you start getting into two and a half D? Okay, so uh, there's two forces that work come into play. In two and a half D, you're able to actually. On a, you know, let's take an example of memory. You're able to access memory at a much lo lower, you know, picojoules per bit metric. So the amount of power is needed to burn to access a given a bit of memory would go down dramatically. The problem is because of you're enabling access to so much more memory, you may actually increase the net power. So, uh, and, and because you're able to uh, handle so much more processing power in your ASIC adjacent to this memory, your overall power will not only go up, but become more dense and you have all your heat sources closer to one another. So this is going to put quite a constraint on thermal dissipation and the strategies needed to pull the heat out of these more densely populated packages. So this is almost compute density more than anything else, right? Sure, although you have compute density, you have a net reduction in the amount of power per computation cycle, but since you can have so much more you know, cycle capacity, power will still go up. But it's critically needed because you're able to do this with the same wafer nodes that already are in production, already well understood, and have lots of IP availability in these existing nodes that may not be available in 16, 14, and below. Um, so it's really pulling more juice out of uh, the lemons that people thought were already squeezed. Javier Delacruz, thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure.